Topic 4.4, water pollution. So we've talked about how to model a hydrological system and how to make it sustainable. What could stop it from being sustainable? Generation of pollution as your output. Organic matter, toxic metals, heat. So nuclear power plants, for example, use water and generate a lot of heat that they dump back in there, which destroys the environment for fish. The type of pollution which has really been in the news lately has been microplastics. We talked about the Great Pacific Garbage Dump. And so plastics obviously float in the ocean. The motion of the ocean grinds them up into smaller and smaller pieces that we call microplastics, and they can get ingested by uh, fish. This can kill them, and unfortunately, eventually, we could probably eat them ourselves. What do we mean exactly by water quality? Uh, so there's lots of measurements we can take in water quality, turbidity, that is how clear it is, the amount of oxygen, ammonia, chlorine, nitrite. If you have a fish tank at home, you're probably familiar with many of these, and there's direct tests you can do to measure them, and there's also indirect. We can just see how things are growing. The one which is um, most important, the one which we talk about the most, of course, is BOD, biochemical oxygen demand. I'd like you to know the definition of this. It means the amount of dissolved oxygen needed by microorganisms to break down organic material through aerobic respiration. Now, it's very important to understand this is not the dissolved oxygen level. It's the amount of dissolved oxygen the microorganisms need. Some people would also say it's the amount of dissolved oxygen everybody needs, including the fish and so forth. And so what goes on here is that in a normal environment, it BOD would probably be pretty low because it's sustainable. However, if you have a large population of microorganisms which take over, they require a lot more oxygen and they can actually suck up the oxygen and it doesn't get to the fish and the larger animals who normally need it to stay alive. How are we going to measure that? It's pretty simple. You just take a sample of water and you measure the oxygen level. You then uh, place it in dark. You see um, how it uh, changes over time, let's say five days. And after five days, you remeasure the oxygen level, and then you know what the biochemical oxygen demand is between the two measurements. Pretty, pretty simple. We're not going to do this in class, but basically it's seeing if anyone's doing photosynthesis in there. What happens if things go wrong? So this happens all the time in fish tanks. You kind of see that algae growing on the side. So what's been going on there? You probably have been uh, doing one of two things, overfeeding your fish. We all do that. Putting too much nitrogen into the system. Or you haven't been cleaning the water very well. So the fish actually put out nitrogen in the form of ammonia. And as the nitrogen levels go up, um, somebody starts using it who normally wasn't growing, and that is some sort of microorganism, probably algae, something like that. Unfortunately, algae, those microorganisms grow a lot faster than the fish would grow, so they keep doubling, doubling in size, and eventually they take over the tank, sucking all the oxygen out of it, and so the BOD goes way up, and the fish start dying because they don't have enough oxygen. We call this an algae bloom. Or if you see it outside, it's called eutrophication. So here we can see a really good example of eutrophication. Now, what was probably going on in this field here? Probably the farmers were over-fertilizing their, their fields here, and the nitrogen in the fertilizer was probably getting into the water supply here, and that caused an algae bloom. Sometimes we see it out in the ocean. There's types of algae that actually turn red. We could call this the red tide. But the bottom line is that you have a decrease in biodiversity because the fish die, they just don't have enough oxygen. And you have a lot of photosynthesis going on there, so primary production, so you have a huge increase in NPP. In other words, the wrong guys are really growing, and they're growing a lot. Here you can see eutrophication of a lake right next door to one which is still clean, and what a difference, right? And so the interesting thing that's going on here, I know this seems ironic, is that this lake is actually dying because you have too much growth. That's kind of funny. In other words, it's dying because of success. 
Every now and then when I go hiking, I come across a small lake and it's just filled with so much stuff and it's so green. It looks like you can almost walk across it. There's so much material. Yeah, it's eutrophication and it's actually dying. And eventually that lake is going to disappear. There'll be no more water in there. It'll just be biomass, organic matter. So this is an um, anthropogenic problem. We have too many fertilizers or leaching from mining areas that go into these lakes and cause this problem. This destroys the biodiversity and also not good for the economy of the local area. What can we do about this? Well, let's go back to the source. We, we should slow down on our use of fertilizers or we could use more natural organic fertilizers. We could try and treat the waste. Uh, be very careful about pet disposal. It has a lot of nitrogen in it. You could try more difficult things like cleaning up the lake, removing the biomass or the mud. Very, very difficult to do that. One method you could do is try and precipitate things out with phosphorus, but very difficult, very expensive, time-consuming to do that. Easier to try and stop it at the beginning. Okay, so now we know what pollution of water is. How do we measure pollution of water? Well, one way we said was you can measure the BOD. But typically, we like to look at living things. If everybody's dying, not a good situation, right? And so we have what are called indicator species. Normally, they're small, uh, sometimes microorganisms, but normally they're small animals. And they're used to tell us how much pollution is in a lake or a river. And so what happens here is that we have indicator species which are Oh, tolerant of some types of pollution, but not tolerant of others. And we have some indicator species that are very, very sensitive. They die right away, and some which really hang on there. So, for example, if we look here, if you have low levels of pollution, right, these guys would still survive, but the nymphs, the stoneflies, are very sensitive, so they die off right away. So as we go up and up and up, we only start to see the guys who are more tolerant to it and you're getting less and less diversity here. So as the pollution levels are low, lots of diversity. As the pollution levels get high, very little diversity. And the only guys you would see there are the ones which are very, very tolerant to high pollution levels. So if you go out there like we learned to do sampling for biodiversity and you measure what's going on here, you can then concoct a indicator species number to tell you what the level of pollution is. So let's just and they, there's sometimes there are different categories, but let's say you had water and you divide it into five categories here. And it tells you what the level of uh, pollution is here. And you can see that more and more pollution means that the BOD was getting high, right? So a little bit of pollution, right? Salmon and trout start to die. If there's a lot of pollution, the only guys we see here are kind of these tube effects worms, right? And the water is highly polluted at this point. And so you can't really use it. Let me say it again. The guys you see who are in really, really polluted water tell you that everybody else has died, basically. We can put this together like we did with the Simpson Biodiversity Index. We can have a biotic index. So the disappearance of indicator species tells us how polluted the water is. Let's just say we had a scale of 0 to 10. So 10 would be very, very polluted water. So animals are assigned how sensitive they are. For example, we said that stoneflies are very, very sensitive and tube effects worms, I haven't put it here, are pretty resistant to a lot of pollution. So we would give them a tolerance number. And then we would use this equation here. You can see it kind of looks similar to the Simpson biodiversity. So how do we get the biotic index here, right? You take little n, it's the number of species in any taxa, Let's not worry about what a taxa is right here. And A would be, this is the thing we're adding here, the tolerance. And so if you go back here again, we said we're going to assign different tolerance levels to the different organisms. And then you divide, of course, by the total number of species in your sample. So let's just go ahead and take a look. Suppose we had this kind of data here, right? This is how many you're counting here. You take the number of each species and you multiply it by the biotic value. So mayflies would have 10, whereas these guys, totally different, midge larvae would have five. And you multiply those guys there and you divide then by the total number, 
Can't think of what the total number here is. I'm going to guess it's probably 100. Looks like it's 100. Nice and easy. And that would give us our biotic index number. There are different ways to report biotic num numbers. Sometimes they report it 1 to 10, depending on how they calculate it. But let's suppose we get a number here between 1 and 100. And then it would tell you if it was greater than 80, the water must be in great shape. If it's less than 40, it's very, very polluted water. Again, we're not looking at all organisms. We're just looking at ones that are indicator species. And normally, not always, but normally they're macro or micro invertebrates, very, very small animals.